Good morning, everybody. Glad to see y'all this morning. I was talking to Kim Raper before I came in, and she was, she's got a good friend that has breast cancer, and she's afraid to be exposed too much. And she said, how are y'all in there? I said, well, we're a little crowded. And I said, but I do it. I still film it every time. And she, I said, you can watch it, because I do. I do. So I got to keep remembering to do that. But I'm glad to see all of y'all this morning. And uh, how many were in early service this morning? Man, what a sermon. So this whole s uh, session, you know, that he's doing on the Matthew is just, uh, wow, it's great. So those are going second. You're in for something. Bob. He's very involved in that love life that does the uh, uh, protest against yes. the abortion clinics. And uh, we ought to have more people joining him in that. Uh, yes. He's been doing it for five years. He's just one of the speakers there. I think once we get through all this COVID mess, I think a lot of stuff will pick up, I'm hoping. And uh, a lot of people have issues with this COVID. You know, well, look how many is not in here. And uh, it's it's growing. I don't know if you keep track of the numbers. Beck and I look at it every day. It was 6,000 people in, in North Carolina got it yesterday. And it was 5,000 the previous two days. Each one of those had five. So we're going up. More and more people are catching it. So. Take out your calculator. Every 48 seconds, a baby is aborted. Mm -hmm. Now, add that up to all the, the viruses that are going around and whatever. It still doesn't even come close. Yeah, it's terrible. It's terrible. Million babies. Another thing, Mike, if you, if you have a heart attack, it's out. You try to fall off, most likely you get killed with tires. Yeah, I've been seeing it. Not on the Yeah. yeah. They'll call a lot of things and a COVID that, death. How many people did they, they say so many died the previous day, out of how many did they test? I mean, how, out of how many hair carriers? There's no way of knowing that. Yeah. Yeah, so they, they, the news media can make an astronomical anything out of it. Exactly. But Nothing it, more important than, than the, what we heard this morning. Yeah. And did you know that Pro-Life Pro was founded in 1942? Well, I think pro-life was found in origin with God. <laughs> but I, I know what you're saying. Bob, you had something you wanted to say? Yeah, the comment to the class. Uh, our Baptist State Convention had their convention at First Baptist Charlotte this year. Yeah. Our pastor sat by himself the whole time. Not a, not a member. Phyllis and I were there, and Phyllis was on the program, so we had to sit in a certain place. Right. But, uh, it's on my heart so we got to start supporting him yes and, and he ought not be by himself no he I agree goes, he ought, his church ought to back him. And, and we're not doing it I not agree yet. all right well let's go uh let's go to the Lord in prayer because I've got a good lesson coming up here I'm excited about and want to get into it so if you will let's go to the Lord in prayer and then we'll start father again we want to pause and just say thank you for another day you've given us Lord we thank you for your mercy and your grace we thank you that we have this church that we can come to freely and worship you. We thank you for our pastor, Lord. We thank you for our members in our church, and we just ask that you would bless them. Now, Father, as uh, we go into this lesson, I pray that you will just speak through me the words that you want spoken. Uh, touch our hearts, Lord. Give us insight into who you are and what you want, and we praise you for it in Jesus' name, and amen. Okay, we're going to start. Okay, I'm here to teach. <laughs> <laughs> Heaven help us. Hear <laughs> I heard that. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. You might learn. <laughs> just on the video. Yes, I know. Well, I've got faith doing me, so. But anyway, <clears throat> does anybody need a quarterly? Because this is the start of a brand new quarter. We're going to be in the book of Luke. And so if you need one, they're up here, but if not, good. It's going to be taken from Luke chapter 1, verses 13 through 25. So if you allow me, let me read it, then we'll come back and we'll discuss it. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and delight to you. And many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, 
and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I am an old man and my wife is well along in years. The angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until, day, to, until the day this happens because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak to them. They realized he had seen a vision in the temple, for he kept making signs to them, but remained unable to speak. When his time of service was completed, he returned home. After this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. All right, our lesson this morning is entitled Planned. Folks, God has a plan for each and every one of us. God has a particular desire for the things that he wants us to accomplish in service to him. Now, a lot of times we give up on God. We become weary because God doesn't particularly show us or answer us in the time frame that we have designated he should. God doesn't operate on our time frame. God operates on his time frame. So, as we start looking at this lesson, there's going to be some things that come out here that I want you to really pay attention to because there's a lot of symbolism here. There's prophecy here. There's all kinds of things in these verses. And it's kind of exciting what God's saying. But first off, the two characters that we're going to be dealing with are Zechariah and his wife, Elizabeth. Zechariah was a priest as he came down through the priestly line of Aaron. And what these guys would do, that they would spend one week from Sabbath to Sabbath going into the temple, and they would offer up incense to God. Then they would come out and pronounce a blessing on the people. Well, the incense was a representation of what? Prayers going up to God. Now, to me, this is a very, a very explicit picture to me because... Zachariah and Elizabeth have prayed for years and years and years for a child. Now, it's very apropos that they've been offering these prayers up. Zachariah's position as the priest is going into the holy place. The holy place is in between the temple where the men would gather, Jewish men would gather, and the Holy of Holies, where only the high priest could go once a year. He would go into the holy place, which is where the priest would go, and he would offer up this incense, which represented the prayers of the people going up before God. Zechariah and Elizabeth had been offering prayers up to God for years, and their prayer, in his mind, had not been answered. And I believe they had come to the conclusion that they were going to remain childless, and never have a child. So there's our scenario. Who, who was Elizabeth? Was Elizabeth kin to anybody? Mary. Mary. They were cousins. Now we can go back into the Old Testament and we can look in a different, lot of different places where God spoke through these prophets of old foretelling of a coming Messiah. But he also foretold of a forerunner who was to come before Jesus and prepare the way. We know that, looking back, that that was John. So, here we have Zechariah. He's in the, the temple, uh, the area of the temple called the Holy Place, and he's doing his duty, which is his part for one week to offer up this incense. So he's gone in there to do that. And while he's in there, an angel 
appears to him. Now, Zacharias, Zachariah, being a priest, knows scripture. He knows that the angels can make appearances. But I believe this angel caught him off guard and he was frightened. You know, you're in there doing your routine, sometimes becomes mundane job, which is one of the sad things in church, is that certain things become mundane. It should not. It should be exciting every time we do it. But Zachariah's in there doing his thing, and all of a sudden, this angel, heavenly being, appears to him standing beside this uh, altar of incense. And that's where we're going to pick up in verse 13. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zachariah. He announced who he was. He said, I know who you are. Do not be afraid. So the first thing he did was to try to calm Zachariah down. He knew he was scared. And then he comes back with his purpose for being there. He said, your prayer has been heard. That word heard not necessarily means got through, but it means there's going to be action taken as in response to your prayer. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son and you are to call him John. How were male children named back in this day and time? Typically after a family member. There ain't no John in his family. It says God wanted this boy's name to be John. And he said, you're going to have a son. Now put yourself in in Zachariah's position. How would you be responding? Yay! Or would you be, yeah, right. I've been praying for years and years and years and gotten no answer. Then the angel goes on, Don. The question might have been from Zachariah also. How do you know? And I think that the, the angel knowing proof that there's life before birth. Yeah. Well, this is predicting. Wow. in the mother's womb. Yeah, this there's is predicting life. a birth before there was ever conception. I'm on the pastor's message. Yeah, I got you. <laughs> All right, so the angel goes on and he says in verse 14, he, meaning John, this baby that has not been conceived yet, will be a joy and a delight to you, Zechariah. And many will rejoice because of his birth. There's prophecy right there being foretold. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. The word Lord there, is that God or could that possibly be Jesus? He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. All right. So after all of these years of apparent silence from heaven, Zechariah was about to receive God's answer in the form of a fourfold promise. Number one, first, Zechariah's wife, Elizabeth, would give birth to a son, not to a child, but to a son designated who it would be and the name will be John a name reflecting God's favor number two the angel's promise was that Zachariah would experience joy and delight now folks the term for delight right there conveys the idea of exuberant, exuberant jubilation uh, another way of saying it jumping up and down for joy that's the way that this delight would be. Then it says also, uh, the multitudes who flocked to hear John preach by the Jordan River would receive or would rejoice the message of repentance, forgiveness, and hope. So this joy and hope was not only for Zechariah, but for the multitudes, for many people, because they're going to understand what's getting ready to come. John came preaching repentance, paving the way for the one that was going to allow us to have salvation. So 
many, many, many people are going to jump up and down for joy because of John, because of what John's paving the way for is Jesus. Okay, the nature of the child's stature with God was the third aspect of this angel's promise. He would be great in the sight of of the Lord. He's going to be great in God's sight, which is kind of the way we're looking at here. But also, I think it's referencing to Jesus because Jesus said there was never a man born unto woman as great as John. I think there's some more prophecy coming up right there. Another quality of the child's stature involved a characteristic of people who took a Nazarite vow. They would never touch anything alcoholic, fermented. Another characteristic of the Nazarite vow was that they wouldn't cut their hair. It doesn't mention that here, but it just says he was not going to have any fermented drink. All right. The fourth aspect we're getting to, it's in the next verse. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous. You, you skipped uh, filled with Holy Spirit. Did you, did in, uh, no, I did not. Okay. I can't see out of these glasses for one thing. <laughs> he will bring back many of the people of the Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah. Thank you, Bob. Yeah, right, yeah. To the hearts, to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. All right, the fourth aspect of the angel's promise was related to the success of John's future ministry. He's not even been conceived yet, and he's already talking about how successful his ministry is going to be. John pre preached a message of repentance. Folks, that is still the greatest message that we need to hear today, is the message of repentance. Because unless we repent... We perish. All right? Some prophets spoke to the nations. John's message is going to be to the Jews, to God's chosen people. John would concentrate on the people of Israel. That's going to be where his message is. John wanders around. You know, he comes out of the wilderness and he's wandering around by the waters and the Jordan and different things down there. And he's preaching repentance. And people are flocking to hear from John, to see what he's got to say. Salvation was to the Jew first and then also to the Gentiles. The Gentiles were never to be left out of this program. The Jew first, then the Gentiles. All right. Now, we're going to start getting down to some things here. John's ministry was the fulfillment of messianic prophecies that Elijah would prepare the way for Christ. Malachi foretold that God would send his messenger in advance of the Messiah's appearance. And Isaiah also predicted that would, one would come to prepare the way of the Lord. This is John. This is who we're talking about. It was predicted. It was foretold in the Old Testament. He was going to come and pave the way. The angel, and by the way, who was the angel? Gabriel. Gabriel. Gabriel was God's messenger. Gabriel stood in the presence of God waiting for direction. How many angels are called by name in the Bible? Six. Who's the other one? Michael. Yes, Michael. All right. So, John came in the spirit and power of Elijah. A lot of people think, or they said, John was Elijah resurrected because Elijah never died. But I don't think so. I think John came in the spirit and power of Elijah. His preaching was powerful, just like Elijah's, even rebuking a king. Got him in trouble too, didn't it? The hearts of the fathers to the children. That's in the next verse right down here where it says that the hearts of the parents to their children, he's going to turn them. That's a strange verse right there. That John's preaching is going to turn the hearts of the parents to their children. So if you read that face value, it sounds like parents were being mean to their kids. 
That's not what that means. The parents are reference to Israel. The children are reference to the Gentiles. John's preaching is to the Jew first, then it's going to go from there to the Gentiles. This is more prophecy coming up here. So the hearts of the fathers being turned to their children is going to be that the Jews are going to t finally take the gospel to the world or else it's going to go there. A lot of the Jews still haven't accepted Christ, but yet look at how many Gentiles are saved. It took, it took place what God said would happen. Some call, scholars see the various turnings to encompass reconciliation between individuals and between people and God. There has to be reconciliation between man and God or else man is lost. Jesus provided that reconciliation. As uh, Russell mentioned, the propitiation of our sins. He was the substitute for us. He paid the price. Jesus did. We don't have to be found guilty. If you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you are destined to an eternal home in heaven. That's what God says. That's what Jesus did. All right, let's move on down here to some <coughs> neat stuff coming up. Verse number 18. Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? Now, folks, that's not just a, a simple, man, how can I know for sure? This is more of a, I don't believe it. There was no faith on Zechariah when it came to this subject. And he basically challenged God is what he's doing. Because what's getting ready to happen to him is kind of, kind of rough. So he says, how can I be sure of this? I'm an old man and my wife, he doesn't say she's an old lady. He just said she's well stricken in years. He was being easy, you know, going back then. The angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. <coughs> he says, I know what I'm talking about. I stand in the presence of God. God told me to come and tell you this. This is going to happen. And you're questioning God. You, of all people, being a priest who are in here doing your priestly duty, are you doing it just because it's just what you're supposed to do? You've lost your joy. You've lost this relationship. But folks, there's more to it than this. We're going to come back here and see some more things in just a minute. He said, and now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their point in time. He was stricken mute what does that mean he can't talk he said you asked how can this be i'm going to give you a sign i'm going to make you mute i'm also going to make you deaf see that in there i believe this is the same the word here is for both you're not going to be able to speak you're not going to be able to hear Turn over in your Bible to verse 62 of Luke chapter 1. Has anybody got a Bible open or is it just the... Yeah. Read, read verse 62, Ann. And they made signs to his father. Okay. They made signs to his father. Why would they make signs if he could hear? Okay, so I think he was struck mute and deaf. Because in verse 62, they made signs to him to try to get him to understand. Didn't know that. As I was studying, I came across it and I went, hmm, that's interesting. And it backs it up with verse 62. So Zechariah had demanded some kind of proof. The angel telling him that wasn't enough. Therefore, a sign was given but it was not the kind of sign that Zechariah wanted. Be careful what you ask for. All he should have said, thank you, Lord. 
and everything would have been okay, but he didn't do that. Because I think he's representative of a lot of us. We pray for certain things to happen. It could be we're praying amiss, but it could be we're praying for something that we really want to happen, and then we give up and say, God's not listening to me. He don't care about me. He's too busy. Whatever the reason. Then what happens when it comes about? Sometimes we do, Chip. God wants us to grow in our faith. Sometimes our faith is weak, and that's where we say, God, I believe the best that I can, but please help my unbelief. The attitude of the heart, I want to believe God. Zechariah, I don't think, really wanted to believe. He'd already resigned himself to the fact this is never going to happen. You're messing with me. Yeah. So therefore, I'm going to give you a sign that this is going to happen. You're not going to be able to talk or hear until it comes about. All right. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. Well, what was he doing in the temple? <clears throat> also arguing with an angel, too. <laughs> His main job was in there to offer up the incense, which represented the prayers of the people. It's ironic that he'd been offering up all these prayers, and there's the prayer being answered, and he don't believe it. What did Zechariah represent? The old way. Law. He was part of the priestly hierarchy coming down, generations, that were to go out, and once a year, the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies, which is where God dwelt, and offer the prayers or the sacrifices of the people to have their sins covered for how long? One year. It was a yearly thing. So it wasn't perfect. It wasn't the ultimate. This was a picture, as the Bible talks about, of looking through a glass darkly. I can see something, but it's obscured. I can't see it clear. It, it's not, I, I can't really understand it all. I'm just doing what God said to do. But there's something coming that's going to be better. There's a better plan coming. It's getting ready to be ushered in because back in the Old Testament, I told you that a forerunner would come before the Messiah. This is him right here. So while Zechariah was in there arguing with the angel, the people are wondering, where is he at? Everybody's used to ritualism. He should be out at a certain time. Where is he? What's going on? When he did come out, he could not speak to them. They realized he had seen a vision in the temple, for he kept making signs to them, but remained unable to speak. He comes out. Do you think he looked different? He was probably white as a ghost after an encounter like that. But he came out and he can't speak, nor hear. So he's coming out and he's, he's making these gestures with his hands to the people. They know something's happened. And he's trying to communicate and he's making all these gyrations. Who knows what, what he's doing? But he's making all this signs to try to get them to understand. Could that not be a representation of the way it is until Jesus comes on the scene trying to see what God's saying to us? I read something that really struck me. It says, this represents to us the weakness and deficiency of the Levitical priesthood. The Old Testament speaks by signs. 
it beckons to us but remains speechless. It is the gospel that speaks to us of that which the Old Testament was only seen through a glass darkly. I said, wow, that's exactly what's going on here. He can't tell them what's getting ready to happen. But his son is going to pave the way for it. John. So it says that after that, verse 23, when his time of service was completed, he returned home. How long was his time of service in being in the temple offering up the incense? A week. From the Sabbath to the Sabbath. Now, let's analyze that. He has an encounter with an angel that strikes him deaf and dumb. He comes out, he can't speak or hear. What would you do? I'd call in sick and go home. I can't be effective. Because part of what he would do is come out and pronounce a blessing after he did offer up the prayers. God's hearing your prayers. Yeah. Did you really believe that, Zechariah? You didn't think so. But here, he might have started, hey, what's going on here? Something. God, I'm going to stay in my position. This is just Mike Charles speculating, okay? You can speculate all you want. I sit around in the shower and, and think of weird things and so forth. You know, when did time start? God. What was the first law? <clears throat> How about something like let there be light? So these are just things how my little mind works. But here, Zechariah decided, I'm going to fulfill my responsibility to do what I'm supposed to do. I can't talk. I can't pronounce it. I can't do anything. All I can do is just go in and offer, put the incense on the altar to, uh, to represent the prayers of the people going up before God. I'll continue to do that. So he did that for the, for the week. Then what did he do? He went home. Now, did Zechariah live in Jerusalem? No. Their home was in the hill country of Judea. Can you imagine the confusion of Elizabeth when he gets home and he's trying to tell her what happened? He can't do it. He can't tell her what happened. He's still probably trying to figure it out. He can't hear her. He goes home. Now, they go through a period of time. They resume their normal life. And something happens. In verse 24, after this. Now, Luke does not specifically tell the time period that's represented by the phrase, after this, but we know it's after he got back home from the temple duties that he was performing. <clears throat> he had to get over the shock of what was going on with him, and Elizabeth had to try to understand what was happening. But after that all got settled, guess what? Elizabeth got pregnant. And it says, for five months... <laughs> She remained in seclusion. Why would she do that? She probably didn't want to hear what people were going to say. This is a miraculous birth, is it not? She was barren. <clears throat> what happened in her sixth month? That's exactly right, Am. Mary went to see her. And what did John do when Mary saw, or Elizabeth saw Mary? He leaped. Beautiful, beautiful story. She remained in seclusion for five months. Perhaps she didn't want to tell the people before her condition, her condition became apparent in order to avoid doubtful remarks by neighbors who had pitied her previous childless situation. Yes, ma'am. But do you think she was also praying thanks 
thanksgiving and prayers and living joy filled <laughs> absolutely it's brenda so it's not a devastating in seclusion it's a time of thanksgiving well it said she was in seclusion, I, and I got to accept it was because she knew she was pregnant, and if she started telling people, no, you're not. God don't like you. That's what they thought. If you were childless, it was basically because you had lost favor with God. It was a horrible thing for a woman not to be able to have a child back then. It was horrible. But now, and I agree with you, I think that whole time she was just worshiping God and praising God, and Zachariah sitting over there, mm -hmm, <laughs> because he didn't. He's seeing it now, but he has to fulfill his punishment time. He's got to deal with it. Elizabeth said, the Lord has done this for me. She took it personal. God answered my prayer. He did this for me. In these days... He has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. You know, it's one of the things this teaches you that it's never too late to, you know, continue to be persistent in prayer. You know, maybe that person that you think has totally gone off the cliff can turn and repent. Yes. So never, never give up on your prayers. Never, you're never barren. Well, exactly right. That's exactly right. She was, it was a very personal thing for her, and she acknowledged it, and she gave God the glory. All right, so, folks, God can speak to you still today. Don't take it lightly. Don't flippantly throw it away. God could be wanting to say something to you. Now, I don't know how many of you that were in early service wrote down that man and lady's name. We need to pray for those two people, Stuart and Lois Steiner. You're going to find out if you weren't there. They are the owners of the abortion clinic in Charlotte, where more abortions are performed than any other clinic in the southeast. They also own one in Atlanta, Augusta, and Raleigh. We need to pray that God softens their hearts. So with that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, again, we thank you for another day. We thank you, Lord, for your mercy. We thank you for your grace. And Father, we just thank you for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What an exciting time we're studying about. As you're getting ready to prepare the forerunner that will come before Jesus to announce him and his ministry. How wonderful it is, Father of what you've given us insight into. We pray now, Lord, that you'd look down upon each one of us as we're gathered in this room, that you would see whatever need might be present in our lives, and that you would meet that need. Father, we would ask that you would bless us with an understanding of what it is you want us to do. Help us to be involved, Father, in you. We pray now, Lord, that you will bless those in the next hour as Brother Mark brings the message to them. And we thank you for all that you're going to do. And we praise you for it in Jesus' name. And amen.